I'm the host, Pastor Reverend Cedric Moore. We want to welcome you to our Tuesday night study. Uh, we've been looking at this uh, study dealing with living life in the spirit. And uh, so far in this study, we've been looking at Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And uh, Mark is introducing to us uh, um, John the Baptist, who was the forerunner, uh, the one who was to come, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was to be the Christ, the Messiah, and the Savior of the world. Uh, Mark wrote his gospel through the eyes of the Apostle Peter, as well as eyewitnesses that he uh, did um, investigate. And so he talks about how that his gospel is the beginning of the good news concerning Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And Mark talked about how Isaiah the prophet, and as well as Malachi, uh, prophesied that there would be a forerunner, one who would prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. And we know and identify that that forerunner was John the baptizer, uh, the son of Elizabeth and Zacharias, his father. And so we talked about how John came and he told them, there's one coming after me who is mightier than I, um, that whose sandals that I'm not worthy to loose. I baptize you with water, but there is one coming after me that will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and that with fire. And so John was um, preparing the nation of Israel to meet their Messiah, which was the Lord Jesus Christ. And so um, we're going to look at Acts chapter 2 tonight. Um, this study deals with the, the coming of the promised Holy Spirit. Uh, John had prophesied that Christ would fill us with the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself had promised that the Holy Spirit would come and fill his uh, followers with God's Spirit and with God's power. And so tonight we want to look at the fulfillment of the coming of God's Holy Spirit. But before we do that, we do have a song that we want to sing. It's in your hymn book, Tis So Sweet, to trust in Jesus. Well, I'm seeing some verses of that. Uh, let's take a look at, let's do all four verses and see if we could end on the, uh, the chords. <clears throat> but Tis So Sweet, to trust in Jesus. We'll sing that and then we'll come back with a brief word of prayer, then we'll move into the study of um, the coming of the promised Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise just to know thus says the lord verse two oh how sweet to trust in jesus just to trust his cleansing blood just in sin for faith to plunge me neath the hill Lent cleanse in flood. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taken, life and rest and joy and peace. I'm so glad. I learned to trust him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that he is with me, will be with me till the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace 
to trust him more. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I'm so glad I learned to trust him. There was a time in my life I trusted it only in myself. But I'm so glad that I've learned to trust in Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we come. We want to come with thanksgiving in our hearts and gratitudes from our lips to say thank you to the true and living God. We know that you are the great I am. We know that, that you are the, the soon and coming king. We know that in you we live, we move, and we have our being. We thank you, Lord God, for every good and every perfect gift that you've given to us. Thank you for the salvation that you've given to us freely through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that he gave his life for sinners so that sinners may be reconciled to God through his death at the cross. He shed his blood, he gave his life as an offering for our sins. And Lord, you were pleased. In fact, you were very well pleased with the sacrifice of your son. So much so that you raised him from the dead three days later. And he ascended back into heaven where he sits at your right hand. We thank you that he is our mediator. That he is our go-betweener. That Jesus is our intercessor. We thank you not only Jesus intercedes, but the Holy Spirit. He intercedes for us. He prays for us with groanings that mere words cannot comprehend. And so we thank you for the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God, our desire is to live for your glory. You told us in your word, whatever we do, in word or in deed, do it all for the glory of God, giving thanks to him through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we give you glory tonight, Lord. We say thank you. And we also ask God tonight that you would forgive our transgressions. Against the Lord, David says, has our sinned and done evil in his sight. And so, God, we realize that we have transgressed, we have missed the mark, we have fallen short of the glory of God. But we thank you that Jesus Christ is our mediator. We thank you, Lord God, that his blood cleanses us from all sin. We come tonight acknowledging that we have sinned. But we also thank you tonight that there is forgiveness with God. We thank you, Lord, that you place our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. And Lord, tonight we also need power to live a life that glorifies you. Because the flesh profits nothing, but it's the spirit that gives life. And as we look at this study, Lord, dealing with the coming of the Holy Spirit, we thank you that he has already come and that he's already indwelt us, those who have accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And he desires to do the same to those who believe the gospel, believe that Christ died, was buried, and raised the third day. And you said, Lord God, that those who call upon the Lord shall be saved. And so we pray tonight for the salvation of lost souls all over the world tonight. For someone who may be watching this broadcast tonight, Lead them to believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the son of the living God, that he loved them, that he gave his life for them, that he was crucified on a Roman cross. But early Sunday morning, three days later, Christ rose from the dead and he sits at the right hand of God. He ever lives to make intercessions for us. And then he's coming back. He's coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so we pray, Lord, that we will be found ready and worthy when you come. We ask that your spirit will guide us now through the study of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And again, thank y'all tonight for coming out tonight. Uh, as we have been looking at this study over the last month or so, dealing with uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, again, this lesson 
uh, is entitled Living in the Spirit, uh, Righteousness, Peace, and Joy. It's what we receive when we live life in the Spirit. Uh, and so, so far in this study, we look at Mark chapter uh, 1. We dealt with what uh, verses 1 through 8, dealing with the description uh, that Mark lays before us that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah of the Jewish people, that he is the Son of God, and that their hope and expectation for a Messiah was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And Mark called this the good news of the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then Mark alluded to, again, to two uh, prophets of the Old Testament, Isaiah as well as Malachi, predicting that there would be a forerunner, one who would uh, prepare the people to meet the Lord. And we looked at that um, forerunner as being that of John the Baptist, um, the um, son of Zacharias and Elizabeth. And John came preaching in the wilderness a message of repentance, and John baptized those who um, repented of their sins in the Jordan River. And so um, John the baptizer came again to prepare the people of Israel to meet their Messiah, to meet their Christ, the Lord. Again, his message was a message of repentance and baptism. And when you repented, he baptized you. And then when you didn't repent, he did not baptize you. And so the Bible says, and John was at the Jordan River and those who came to him, such as the prostitutes, um, such as um, the tax collectors and sinners, when they confessed their sins, John baptized them. But he also said that I baptize you with water, but there is one coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so when we look at uh, this, it says that John said he baptized. Now the word uh, baptize is... Um, the word baptism is actually a transliteration of a Greek word um, that means baptizo, which means to baptize. Uh, baptizo means to immerse, uh, to take completely into the water. Uh, we also discover that John did this at the Jordan River. Uh, he immersed them beneath the water as a sign of their repentance from their sins. And so those who were baptized, um, he, they were doing it as a sign of their repentance toward God. Now, being, being a sign of repentance, baptism was an identity marker. Those who were baptized had marked themselves as belonging to the holy set-apart people of God once again. Uh, previously, God had set them apart by his covenant with Abraham. And so the Jews were known to be set apart as God people because of the Abrahamic covenant. And a sign of the covenant was that of circumcision. When a male child was eight years old, he was given the name. Uh, and then he also was um, circumcised in his foreskin uh, as a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. And so in the Old Testament system, uh, the, the sign that the Jews belonged to God was the sign of the um, circumcision, a part of the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, but then God's people would rebelled against him. And then God allowed some things to happen to the nation of Israel because of their rebellion. One of the things that God allowed to happen to the nation of Israel because of their rebellion was that God allowed the Babylonians to destroy their temple which led to the next nation to be in exile into Babylon. And we know that some of the uh, people that were exiled into Babylon was what? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so God allowed them, uh, the Babylonians, to come in and destroy the temple. I know the temple among God's people represented God's presence among his people. And so because they disobeyed God, God allowed them to be captured and taken into captivity for 70 years because of their rebellion. And then the second thing, the reason why that uh, though they were back in the promised land after the exile, they were still oppressed by the Romans. And so they were first were oppressed 
by and taken into captivity by the Babylonians. But then in, in this day and time where John the Baptist was preaching and then Jesus came, they found themselves still under Roman domination. And then third, even though the temple was rebuilt because no Herod rebuilt the temple for the Jewish people, it took him 42 years to complete this temple. And so even though the temple had been rebuilt in Jerusalem, God's spirit uh, that did not dwell in that temple. Uh, they had began to just practice religion. Remember, Jesus comes to the temple, and what, what does he find? Money changes, right? And he says, get these things out of here, for it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves or robbers, right? And then he clears the temple. Take this um, whip, whip them out of there, overturn the money tables, change his, change his table, uh, loose all those doves. And so they were going through this formality of religion. Uh, God's spirit was not in the temple because if God's spirit was in the temple and the religious system, there would be no need for John the Baptist to come preaching in the wilderness. Notice that John the Baptist was not at the temple. He was not a part of the religious establishment of the Jewish people. John was preaching in the wilderness and he was, and the people were coming to him throughout all the regions, right? So that religious system at the temple was a dead system. All they did was what offer up what sacrifice after sacrifice, but God was not in the temple. It's just like today, many people seem to think that God is at the church building and that he just sits here and waits on us to come on Tuesdays and on Sundays. God doesn't dwell in temples made by man's hands. That's what Solomon said when he built the temple, the first temple. He said, God, we know that you... Heaven is your what? Throne. And so, Lord, this temple just represents a place where you can, what, your presence dwell. But when they rebelled against God, guess what? God removed his presence. So now they have this empty form of religion, right? And we have a lot of world religions that are just empty forms of religion. They say, well, if I just would practice uh, my rituals, I pray three times a day. I give alms to the poor. Uh, I treat my neighbor right. Then God will accept me. Well, that's religion. The only way that God accepts us is through what? Faith in Jesus Christ, right? And so God allowed them to go into Babylonian captivity. Um, God also allowed the Romans to what? To, um, to overpower them. And now they got to pay tribute to, uh, to Caesar, uh, give homage to Caesar. And then when they rebuild the temple, guess what? God's presence is not even in the temple. And so they were going through all these religious formalities. But when John came, John said, there's one coming after me. And he will what? Fill you with the Holy Spirit, right? And so that's what we see. Uh, that John's unusual description is marked marked him as a man who had what been set apart by God. He was no he wasn't a part of the, the present day temple and his religious system. And so John was set apart in the way that he what he preached the word of God. He was set apart by the by the clothes that he wore, wore what camel's um hair. Uh, and then also he was set apart by the diet that he had. He ate what locusts and wild honey. And then we discover here that John, again, is pointing people to the common Messiah. And John told them, again, I baptize you with water, but there is one coming after me who is mightier than I, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so John lived a set apart life. His clothes, his message, and his diet set him apart from the priest's and the Pharisees at the temple. John was filled with the Holy Spirit uh, even before his birth. Let's look at Luke chapter one. And so here's a man who understood what a spirit-filled life was, not what, not what religion is, 
But John was spirit filled. You can be still, you can be very religious, but not be spirit filled. Amen. And so what set John apart was that he was filled uh, with the Holy Spirit from his uh, conception. Let's look at uh, Luke chapter one. And let's I get someone to read verse 11 through 17. And there appeared upon him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zachar, Rias, oh, exactly. okay, saw him, he was troubled and fear, fall, fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zachar, for their prayers is heard. And they will, wife Isabel shall be, bear their, a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled, filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. All right, y'all see that? So right from his conception, he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. In fact, the scripture talks about that when Elizabeth travels, um, uh, not Elizabeth, but when Mary travels to visit Elizabeth, who is now pregnant with John the Baptist, and, um, and, and Mary is pregnant with Jesus, the scripture says that the babe in um, Mary's womb leaped, um, or Elizabeth's sons, I'm sorry, Elizabeth's son, John, leaped in her womb at the sound of Mary's voice. Uh, and so here was John, again, set apart by God. Um, the scripture says that he would be great. Um, he was to be a Nazarite. He was not to drink strong drink or wine. Uh, he was, no, the, in, that's an old Old Testament system where you can take a vow to be a Nazarite, set apart life. You were not to cut your hair. You were not to drink strong drink. And in fact, uh, Samson was a Nazarite. Uh, he was not to cut his hair. He was not to drink uh, strong wine. And he was not to hang around any dead corpses. And so John the Baptist, likewise, was a Nazarite uh, from birth. He was set apart by God. And the scripture says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. So John knew what it was to have the Spirit of God living inside of him. That's why he didn't have to go to the religious system down at the temple and try to be made right with God. He was already made right with God because he was already filled with the Spirit of God, right, even from his birth. And again, John is now pointing people to the one who, would, who could fill them with the same Holy Spirit, and that was Jesus Christ himself. And so um, as one would, uh, let me read this. And John spoke of Jesus as the one who would fill people with the Holy Spirit. Uh, real quick back to John chapter one, I'm sorry, Mark one and eight. Mark chapter one, verse eight. And let's see what uh, John. I indeed have baptized you with water. But he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Okay, and so we see here that John is making this um, this statement that I indeed baptize you with water. And the one that was baptized in the water was one who's what repented of their sins. And now they are ready to meet the Lord. And so as we now move to Acts chapter 2, because John said there's one coming and he's going to fill you with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so that's where we now move to um, Acts chapter 2. Uh, we, we are baptized as believers with the Holy Spirit the moment we place our faith in Jesus. 
The moment you accept Christ, you repent of your sins, you are indwelt with the Spirit of God. Let's look at Acts chapter 1. Acts 1, and we'll look at verse 4 and 8, and these are the words of Christ, right? Acts chapter 1, and this is where we see the chapter, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which said, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will I at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the season, which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witness unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Okay. Thank you, brother. Bob. Any comments that y'all see that you want to share in regards to Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, Jesus speaking to the apostles before he ascends back into heaven? Uh, he was letting them know it's not for you to know. Mm -hmm. In other words, he said it ain't your business. <laughs> it's my business. It's the Father's business. Yes, ma'am. So, you know, don't be asked no question. Just do what is told of you to do. Okay. Obey. Yes, ma'am. Be obedient. Yes, ma'am. To the word. Okay. Anyone else have some insight on verses 4 through 8 in Jesus um, speaking to apostles? Because in every season, there is a reason for every season. Yes, ma'am. There is something different in every season. And God does these seasons for us to get something out of it because he put his own power. We don't have no power. Yes, ma'am. It's his power. Yes, ma'am. And so he's letting us know. But if you do all these things, you will receive power. Okay. But you will receive it from all that. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. At the, at the end of verse 6, it says, um, when they came together and saying, asking of him, saying, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Mm -hmm. Were they asking him, was he going to um, like, rise again? Like set up his earthly kingdom yeah. see again remember when we were talking about Mark Mark was talking about how the people were waiting for a messiah yes. the, the, yeah. to them the messiah was a king uh, he was a military leader just like David was in the days of King David and so keep in mind they're under Roman domination or oppression they're in their own land but Rome is over them. They have to pay taxes to Caesar. And so they're asking Jesus, Lord, are you going to set up your kingdom now? Oh. Yeah. Because remember, uh, even two of Jesus' disciples, their mother came, it was James and John, their mother came and said, Lord, when you set up your kingdom, can my two boys, James and John, one sit in your right hand, one in your left hand? So the, the Jewish people had an expectation that Jesus was that Messiah King, the one who was going to reign on the earth and what, they was going to be back on top again. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Pastor, where are all done? Uh, Israel, today is God talking to you. They still are, yes, sir. They're in scripture. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, we won't let them Destroy another. Yes, sir. Because Saddam, I mean, that dude who went to war with, saw the missile over there. He backfired on his folks. God yes, sir. He just on his folks over there. Yes, sir. He was trying to shoot that Israel. God wouldn't let him down there. Yes, sir. And, and, and he backfired and killed all the people over there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
So yeah, Israel is God's chosen people. But they want to uh, fight for America, but America told them, no, get to die. Yes, sir. Yeah. They yes, yeah, sir. People America. America handled it way. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, ain't nothing go against that country. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. We God chosen people. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, sir. And so we see here in this text, and being assembled together with them, that is with the apostles, he that is Jesus commanded them. This was not a suggestion, but he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. Because it's very important that they stay in Jerusalem. Because in within, what, 50 days, Jesus is going to send the promised Holy Spirit upon them. And so if God tells you to do something, commands you to do something, it's very important that you obey, right? And so he says, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to what? Wait for the promised Holy Spirit. Now, some of the earth following verses lets us know what they were doing while they were waiting for the Holy Spirit, right? And so if you look at, uh, for example, verse 9. Now, when he had what spoken these things while he while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they were looking steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Many believe that these were two angels who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So Jesus departs, he go back into heaven at this time. Notice what they're doing while they're waiting on the Holy Spirit to come upon them because Jesus told them what? Wait in Jerusalem. Now if they had gone to Samaria or, or, or any other place, they would be out of the will of God. Right? But notice what we find them in verse 14. Verse 12. Then they returned to where? Jerusalem. From the mount called Olivet, which is what? Near Jerusalem. A Sabbath day journey. And when they had what? Entered, they went up into the upper room where they were what? Staying. So we see some of the apostles who were there, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaea, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now his brothers believed. After his resurrection, his brothers come on board. They believe that their brother, Jesus Christ, is the Lord God. He is the Savior of the world. So they're in a place where Jesus tells them to wait. And then we discover that while they're waiting, while they're praying, they also select another apostle to take Judah's place who had committed what betrayal and who hung himself. And the scripture says they, they were... They posed two men, and the lot fell on what Matthias, and he became numbered among the twelve. So while they're waiting, they're taking care of what spiritual matters. They're praying. Uh, they're um, they're um, asking God to reveal to them who the next apostle will be to help them carry on this good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is telling them, wait for the promise. That's what he tells them in verse 4 but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Now he quotes what John did, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be what baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So now the count, countdown begins, and we discover here that they were waiting on the promised Holy Spirit. Now again, um, we're filled with the Holy Spirit a promise the moment we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. Um, let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13. 
talking about the body of Christ, Paul uses the, the analogy of the human body to teach us a spiritual principle that we are the body of Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, where we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we born or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Okay. Y'all see that? So Paul uses the analogy of the human body because the human body has many parts, right? Mm -hmm. Two eyes, a nose, two ears, a mouth, uh, hands, feet, legs. And so Paul is saying just like the human body, because look at verse 12 of that same chapter. For as the body is one, in other words, you got many parts, but you only got one body. For as the body is one and has what many members or parts, you can say parts, body parts, but all the members of that one body being many or one body. So also or likewise, just like your body has many parts, but you only got one body. He says in the same way, so also is Christ's body. That is the church, the Christian. For by one spirit, that is God's Holy Spirit, right? We were all baptized into the one body. And he's not talking about water baptism. He's talking about spirit baptism. So the moment you accept Christ, you're baptized by the Holy Spirit, which places you into the body of Christ. Whether Jew or Greek, and I think this translation said Gentile, which is a non-Jewish person, whether you slave or free, no matter what your status is, you could be a slave and still be saved. You could be a free person and still be saved and have all been made to drink into one spirit, right? And so God has one Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit unites us into the body of Christ. And so we are all baptized with the Holy Spirit the moment we place our faith in Christ Jesus. And so Jesus is telling them in Acts chapter one, wait in Jerusalem for the fulfillment of the promise for John baptized you with water, but not many days from now you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Again, they ready to get this kingdom thing going, right? That ought to be the same hope and the expectation that we have as Christians, right? Amen. We're so sometime uh, there's a saying we can be so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good All right. but these uh, apostles were heavenly minded they wanted the kingdom of God to be established on the earth right and so we're waiting to go to heaven but they were looking for an earthly kingdom mm -hmm. and they were saying Lord when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel and Jesus said that's not now that's not in God's uh, season right now. God has something else in store right now. Right. Now there will be a time when Jesus will establish his what right. earthly kingdom. It's called the millennial kingdom to where he will reign in Jerusalem for a thousand years mm -hmm. and we will reign with him. Yeah. So there will be an actual fulfillment of Jesus coming to rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years. But not now he says. But guess what? Before the millennial, there will be the church age. Mm -hmm. And that's where he tells them, that's not for you to be concerned with because the father has put his own authority on when these things will happen. Mm -hmm. But you shall what receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Yeah. And what will the Holy Spirit's power enable them to do according to that verse? What's the purpose of the Holy Spirit in your life? According to Acts 1, verse 8. It gives you the power and the will and the knowledge to do the thing that God wants you to do. What's the main purpose that God wanted, wanted them to do according to that verse? Obey. 
to witness. There you go. To witness. To be a witness. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. That's the, that's the purpose of being spirit-filled, to be a witness unto Jesus, right? Uh, and then he tells out how the places they were to be witnesses for him in Jerusalem. That was the first place they were to be a witness, right there in the middle where they were already located. They were to be a witness at home. And then they were to spread abroad into what? To the further regions, to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the Holy Spirit comes in your life so that he gives you power to be a witness for Jesus. Yes, sir? I talked to you, you know, I talked to you about when I was with you. Yes, sir. Saying, the Holy Spirit was telling me three words that I couldn't understand what God was just throwing to me, and I felt the presence of the Lord in that place. Yes, sir. Somehow the devil got mad because I almost had him hooked. Yes, sir. God wanted me. He yes, sir. He about to follow me, but the devil spoke up. So, you end up not obeying the spirit. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. And so, yeah, God gives us the power yeah. through his Holy yeah. Spirit to witness yeah. of Jesus. And so that's what we see here in that Acts chapter 2 records the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Let's look at Acts chapter 2 now. So Jesus makes the promise in Acts chapter what 1 saying that the Spirit will come not many days from now, wait in Jerusalem. And so now the promise is about to be fulfilled, not many days from now. Jesus is now in heaven, right? Because we just saw in verse 9, he what goes back to heaven. You know, Jesus had told them in the Gospel of John, he says, it's more expedient that I leave, because if, if, if I don't leave, the Spirit won't come. And so as soon as Jesus leaves, guess what? Now there is an opportunity for the spirit to come. See, when Jesus was on earth, he, they, their power was, um, was delegated to them through Jesus, right? Yes. Now Jesus can only be in one place. <laughs> he couldn't be in Jerusalem and Samaria at the same time. But guess what? When the spirit comes, the spirit indwells all believers. Now where you go, the Spirit goes with you. And we can now witness to more people in different places because the Spirit indwells all of us. Amen. And so we see here in Acts chapter 2, let's read um, verse 1 of Acts 2. Acts 2 verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, we were all with one accord in one place. Okay, and so these same disciples, many believe there's uh, 120 uh, disciples gathered in the upper room at this time. And the reason why I say 120, uh, let me go back to Acts chapter 1. And let me see if I can find that reference. Acts chapter 1. I'm probably looking at it and don't see it yet. <clears throat> Let me uh, let's see. Let's see here. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. This is Acts 1 14. With the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was what? About 120. So 120 devoted followers of Jesus Christ were in this upper room, devoting themselves to prayer and waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. 
And now we discover when Brother Bobby read in Acts 2 verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They referring to that what 120. And so Acts chapter 2 records the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now the word Pentecost means 50, like the number 50. And it refers to the Feast of Weeks, uh, where they celebrated um, 50 days after Passover was another Jewish feast called the Feast of Weeks. And so the word Pentecost means 50. Uh, it was a celebration of the harvest. Let's look at uh, Exodus 34. Go back to the Old Testament, because when we read a, uh, a scripture and it comes up with a, a word, we need to find out what, what is that word. Now, what is Pentecost? Now, we may say, well, and the day of Pentecost had fully come. Well, what is Pentecost? Well, let's go back to the scriptures to find out um, what Pentecost is. Exodus 34, 22 and 23. Exodus chapter 34. And again, it means 50th. The 50th day after Passover. Exodus 34, 22 through 23. And it's known by, I believe, the Feast of Weeks. Who would like to read that for us? Exodus 34, 22 and 23. And thou shalt observe the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of the gathering of the year's end. Thrice in the year shall all your men children appear before the Lord God and God, the God of Israel. Okay. And y'all see that there? To, there? They were to celebrate these feasts that God had commanded for the nation to celebrate. And he says, and you shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest. And so it was a feast celebrating the wheat harvest. They're thanking God for the harvest of the wheat that God gave them. And so, and you shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Three times in the year, all your men, y'all see that? Yeah. Men were to take the lead and coming before God three times a year. You know, you had these uh, special feast days that God says, I command that all men come before me. Three times in the year, all your men shall appear before the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. And notice what God would do when all the men showed up and left their homes and left their crops left their property. You say, ooh, all the men in one place, ain't nobody protecting the house. <laughs> the Bible says, except the Lord, what? Protect the house, build the house. Those who build, build in vain, except the Lord be the watchman. Those who watch, watch in vain. Notice what happened when they obeyed God in observing these feasts. Look at verse 24 of Exodus. For I will cast out the nations before you and enlarge your borders. Neither will any man covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. Y'all see it? In other words, God says, I'm going to protect what is yours. If you obey me, if you reverence me, if you do what I command you to do. What would happen if all the men would obey God? God says, forsake not the assembly of yourselves or some in the habit of doing. And what do we do? We find some of me, the men of God at the house on Sunday. Amen. <clears throat> but God says, if you obey these feast days, if you honor me that I've commanded you, I will take care of your enemies. I'm not going to let your enemies what invade your land and take your crops if you obey in me. And so that's what we see here in this. Uh, so when we come to this word Pentecost, it means 50th. 
And so they were to observe these three festivals, one of them being what the Feast of Weeks, uh, the end gathering at the end of the year, um, which also, um, again, Pentecost means 50th and it refers to the Feast of Weeks, which was celebrated 50 days after Passover. Anybody remember what Passover was? Yes, sir. That's right. In Exodus chapter what? Uh, I believe it's chapter um, 13 and 14. And so this was 50 days after Passover that they celebrated this um, Pentecost. Let me, um, yeah. Let's look at Exodus chapter 12. This is, again, one of these uh, days of memorial that they were commanded by God to do. I'm going to start reading at Exodus 12, starting with verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop that is branches, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lentil and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. Y'all saw it? And so we see here that this is one of the other feast days or ordinances that God had told the nation of Israel to observe continually. Mm -hmm. And so this other day is what the day of Pentecost, meaning the 50th, uh, 50 days after Passover, they were to celebrate this feast of what weeks, which what celebrated the harvest of, of the grain harvest that God had uh, blessed them with. Mm -hmm. And so Passover, which was celebrated between the month of May and June, Let's look at Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23, verse 15 through 22. They would also celebrate this Passover. Leviticus chapter 23, 15 through 22. So just to give you some background of some of these uh, festivals and feasts that God commanded the nation to do. And when they obeyed God and what? did these feast days, God promised to protect them from the enemies and wouldn't allow their enemies to come and conquer their nation. Leviticus 23, 15 through 22. You said what, Pastor? Leviticus 23 what? 15 through 23. Two twenty-two. Okay. And my read are, and ye shall fifteen. Yes, ma'am. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye bought the shaft of the way offering. Seven Sabbath will be complete, even unto the to the the morrow. After the seventh Sabbath day, Sabbath, shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Ye shall bring out of your habitation two wave loaves of two tent gear. They shall be of fine flour. They shall, they shall be baked with leaves, leaven. 
they are the first fruit unto the Lord. And ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year, and one young buck, and two rams. They shall be brought for a burnt offering unto the Lord. With their meat offering and their drink offering, even an offering made by fire of sweet savour unto the Lord. Then ye shall sacrifice one kid of the goat for a sin offering, and two lambs for the first year for a sacrifice of peace offering. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruit for a wave offering for the Lord. For the two lambs they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And ye shall proclaim on the self, self same day that it may be an holy con congregation unto you. Ye shall do no severe work therein. It shall be a statute for ever and all your dwelling throughout your generation. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt make clean ready on the corner of thy field when thou reapest. Neither shall thou gather any glean of thy harvest. Thou shalt lead them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Okay, thank you, sis. And so here, here are the instructions for celebrating the Feast of Weeks, right? And the key verse is um, verse what, 16. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a what? New grain offering to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so this is where we get this concept of the uh, Pentecost, which means 50 days after the Passover. And so this feast or this festival was held in Jerusalem and during Pentecost an offering that is, the first fruits of their grain was offered to God, according to Leviticus 23, verse 20. Likewise, the Holy Spirit came on this day to gather the first fruits of believers into the church. So when we go back to Acts chapter 2, um, there's this similarity or this picture, just like they were to commemorate 50 days after Passover um, and to what? for this um, grain offering, uh, that they that giving praise to God for the grain offering, uh, for the harvest. In the same way, God used now Pentecost as the first fruits of gathering people into the body of Christ, the church. So it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, talking about those 120 believers. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. Y'all see that? The Holy Spirit came with a sound uh, from heaven as the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Now, wind is something that you cannot see, right? But you can feel the effects of wind, right? And so the Bible says when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, he came with the sound or like the sound of a mighty rushing wind from heaven. Wind is frequently used in the scriptures to picture the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's go to the Old Testament, Ezekiel 37. So anytime we talk about wind in the Bible, it's a picture or a reference to that of the Holy Spirit. We're going to go to Ezekiel 37, verse 9 and 10, and then I need someone to turn to John chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. I'm going to read Ezekiel 37, 9 and 10, and I need someone to read John chapter 3, verse 5 through 8. And the point we're making is that when is frequently used in the scripture to picture the Holy Spirit. In Ezekiel 37, verse 5 through 8, it says, <clears throat> Thus says the Lord God to these bones. Remember the Lord told Ezekiel, go into that valley of dry bones. 
and these bones were very dry. And God says to Ezekiel, thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. You shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Verse nine. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath. Thus says the Lord God, come forth four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, and they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. So the bones were in representation of the nation of Israel. And so God told them to prophesy to the old dry bones. And he says in verse 11, he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry. Our hope is lost and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. God said, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. Mm -hmm. And so let's read one more scripture for tonight and then we'll close and pick up. We're talking about how the Holy Spirit is represented uh, of being like the wind. Let's look at John 3, verse 5 through 8, and then we'll close and pick up. Lord's will next week. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit is give birth to spiritual life, give birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Okay. And so just like in the same way that the wind blows and you don't see it, but you see the effects of the wind, so is everyone that is born of the spirit, right? Uh, the spirit is something that you can't see, but you can see the effects of the spirit of God in a believer's life. And Jesus said, and so is everyone that is born of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And so the spirit is frequently used in the scriptures to picture the Holy Spirit or the wind is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And it's the Spirit of God in us that gives us life, new life, just like he did to those dry bones in Ezekiel. And Jesus said the Holy Spirit gives life to those who trust in him. We want to thank you tonight. We do pray that um, you've understood the scriptures tonight in regards to uh, the promised Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes into the life of the sinner who repents and believes the gospel of Jesus Christ, believing in his life, death, and resurrection from the dead. And the moment that you place your faith in Christ, repent of your sins, you're born of the Spirit of God, and, you, and you're united with Christ uh, through um, baptism and faith and belief in Jesus. 
We want to invite you to join us on Sunday morning at 11 for our morning worship service. We will also have a second service this coming Sunday for the Passing Wives 17th anniversary. Our host, pastor, and church will be Pastor Christopher Knowles and the True Vine Baptist Church of Tyler, Texas. Uh, that service will be at 3 p.m. So we invite you to come and worship with us at 11 and also at 3 p.m. this coming Sunday. Until that time, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you is our prayer.